something, a background, a profile that we pulled from the Poverty Justice Center. Um, how, you know, how did you get there? What did it take to get you to be the darling of the po Poverty Justice Center that they would highlight and write such a accurate, factually accurate, glowing biography of you? I um, called people groomers, basically. That, and that so <laughs> that's about it. And I'm calling people groomers today, as a matter of fact, too, because if you follow the news, Daniel Smith, who's the premier, that's a.k.a. governor of um, Alberta, Canada, laid out uh, some new policies in Alberta that prevent, um, for yeah. example, transgender uh, men who are acting as women from participating in women's sports and uh, that prevent transgender surgeries and uh, medical treatments under 16 and there's a third one. It's the same th three things that are in the Protect Kids CA uh, ballot initiative there in California. So they push that into policy in Canada. And so the Canadian groomers are losing their mind. And technically, it's actually against the law to call them groomers in Canada. Um, that is actually a, a form of criminal hate speech. Uh, but here in the U.S., we still have the First Amendment. We can still do that. But things like, you know, your Wikipedia entry will then reflect it and the Southern Poverty Law Center will then be mad at you and call you general hate and write a profile against you that gets used against you for anything slightly potentially professional in your life that ever might come up after that. Well, it makes sense. We have to do that. We have to label and brand people so that we can pit them against each other, you know, label them and put them in boxes so that they can easily be positioned, pitted against each other so they can fight and not have civic, uh, civil discourses like um, like your podcast and like you have been trying to do actually for for a very, very long time. Um, you know, I reading your background, I, I didn't know about your your doctorate and your your, your various degrees in mathematics. Um, it, it makes more sense to me now that you have been doing the work that you have been doing in the way that you have. It, it shows how you analyze and approach things. When you were studying, I mean, did you have any idea that your work would take you into the fields and, and into the arenas that you're currently circulating right now? No. When you do math professionally, you think you're going to do math for the rest of your life. And that's about all you're going to be allowed or able to do. And so, no, I had no idea. I wanted to be a math professor. I was kind of fed up with the direction that the universities were taking with regard to trying to maintain student enrollment, uh, which kind of very you know, generally results in things like grade padding, but it also results in being held hostage by students that don't really want to put up with the policies of the school. In other words, it allows a very small activist group to renormalize the institution, which is, I think, what's largely happened. I mean, there are other forces that have twisted the universities, but I think that that was a big one. But I wanted to get out. So I stopped doing math in 2010. And, um, I found my way into this by fighting with people online, as one does. And, um, I just kept digging and digging. And then sooner or later, I realized just how bad this, you know, activist scholarship is, which led to realizing it's not just activist scholarship and it's not just leaking out of the universities. It's actually a global push. This is my conspiracy theories that there's a global push for communism um, being put across, especially Western, the Western civilization, Western nations uh, very vigorously right now. And so you no, actually, did, you did not expect it. Did you experience that firsthand as you were in academia? You start, you had these frustrations and then that's what led you to leave and then to continue looking into it. Is that what you're saying? Not exactly. I mean, I was my last couple of years there, the faculty meetings or the teachers meetings that we would go to, the instructors meetings would strongly encourage us to fail as few students as possible, give extra credit, keep their keep their grades up. Um, give them, you know, make sure they keep their scholarships, keep their morale high and make them think that they can succeed rather than, you know, weed them out kind right. of attitude. And, and even just kind of a neutral attitude to where it's like my thought, my, my teaching approach would have been since I wasn't teaching like a precursor to engineering where right. weeding them out is important. My thought was really, you know, if they pass, they pass, if they fail, they fail. It's right. let's just teach the class honestly and see what happens. But that wasn't what the department wanted to do. But it was really kind of before the woke tide that it was only happening in the humanities. There's only one time I ever actually ran into it in person on campus. I had no idea what I was looking at. Yeah. Um, I went to go to dinner and I had to walk across campus to get to the restaurant. And I happened to walk through a crowd, a huge protest outside and they had signs. But what they were protesting, it was it was the humanities graduate students were protesting for higher 
stipends um, saying that they were underpaid and they engaged me and asked me, well, it's just, you know, early twenties yeah. or whatever. And they asked me if I wanted to join their protest. And I said, no, I wanted to go to dinner and I didn't really feel the need to push for higher wages as a grad student. And then they asked me um, how much I get paid. And I told them, and it turns out to be significantly more than they did. Yeah. And they said, how can that be? That's not fair. I said, well, I'm in math. What are you in? And they said English. And I said, well, skilled labor pays and walked off on these people. And they were very upset with me, but I had no idea what I was running into. Wow. Uh, well, and I want to just be very clear when I say these arenas and this work that you're doing. So people know you, in my opinion, you are the leading expert on critical race theory, which has led you, your studies and your work in that arena has led you to completely reject it, despite my my tweets to the contrary, they were sarcastic. Um, you are the founder of the extremely inordinately successful podcast, New Disclosures. Um, you, discuss, excuse me, Discourses. You have authored six, now seven books, uh, the newest one being The Queering of the American Child, How a New School Religious Cult poisons the minds and bodies of normal kids. I want you to tell us what you really feel about schools <laughs> in a second, but that's your newest book. Congratulations, by the way. And, and again, you guys, again, for those people who may not be familiar, you are familiar with his work in 2018 with two other authors. I don't even know what you would call this, investigative journalism, journalism, a social experiment, like I would call it personally guerrilla warfare, where yourself, Helen Pluckrose and Peter Bogosian did this, like I said, this clandestine um, guerrilla warfare attack on academia where you wrote approximately 20 fake papers and that using like just woke left jargon, those like hot button topics and keywords, you submitted these fake journals, these papers, excuse me, to real journals and got almost half of them published. So if people don't know, they certainly know that. And that really you know, pulled the veil back on academia and exactly what you're what you're talking about. So, I mean, that's amazing. I, I that's where I fell in love with your work and and really started listening to you and and, and tuning in. So, thanks for doing that. I mean, what? It, how did you meet Helen and Peter? Actually, like, how did you guys start your work together? I wish this was an exciting story, but the answer is Twitter. Um, <laughs> it's not actually... an exciting story at all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Peter and I met on Twitter and started writing together maybe in 2000, either 13 or 14. And mm -hmm. then I actually did not like Helen at first on Twitter. And we argued on Twitter around that same time. But we yeah. got to be friends maybe a year after that. Started writing together maybe closer to 2016. Um, and she doesn't, she had never really worked well with others in her writing, but we we had a pretty successful collaboration. So I became like the vertex of a weird V of, yeah. of writing. And when Peter and I, before we did what's now called the Grievance Studies Affair, um, Peter and I did a trial balloon hoax yeah. paper that was called yeah. the conceptual penis as a social construct. Yes. And Helen defended it, but did not participate in that. And so when we started the Grievance Studies Affair a few months later, we asked Helen if she would help us right. since she had some background in theory and we realized that we were going to need at least something to help us decode what we were looking at because we didn't understand it yet. And um, that was a really interesting project. I think it's never been more relevant. We're seeing all this, you know, fraud, outright fraud coming out, Harvard and other major universities, especially in these kind of DEI sectors, these presidents, Cl Claudine Gay being the main one, of course. And I, I just saw that the thing came out today. There's a fourth major you yeah. know, fraud scandal at Harvard in terms yeah. of academics. I think we're seeing the very, very, very peak of a very big iceberg. But within that, there is a related problem that's not just plagiarism or data manipulation or whatever else. And that's what the Grievance Studies Affair was showing, which was that even completely by the book scholarship has a tremendous quality problem. Um, right. if, if you were to ask me, do you think that they could just be making things up and getting it published? I would tell you they most certainly can <laughs> because right. that's exactly what we did. Right. Um, so I know you can just make stuff up and get it right. published right. Uh, in, in academic journals. I don't know how significant they are, but eventually those things can end up building out um, schools of thought and eventually even sub-departments or departments in universities. But the entire DEI 
uh, phenomenon, which is not exactly a small phenomenon. It's global. It's tens of billions of dollars a year are being dumped into it. It's at every corporation, every institution, every school. That's all built off of this scholarship that, like I said, you could, I don't think you can even call it scholarship. It's activism posing as scholarship. And it's, I guess, in a legal sense, it's not, you know, right. it's not intellectual property theft. So in a legal sense, it's better than plagiarism. But in, in all, for all intents and purposes, it's just as bad or worse than the plagiarism. Plagiarism of legitimate scholarship at least reproduces legitimate scholarship. This scholarship is right. completely illegitimate. Right. Well, I mean, and for people who might not believe what you're saying, they a lot of this audience grew. And I don't know if you're familiar with my work, but, you know, I pivoted my law firm and became like a, a huge self entire self declared human and civil rights law firm and organization in 2020 with the covid with the pandemic. Um, and people were refusing to believe the, the, the data and the science and the studies and the journal articles that predated basically 2016 is what we found. That was kind of like a tipping point because they started to unleash their plans to leading up to 2020. So if for people to understand in context, a, a lot of this uh, community came from the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the fraud um, and just basically murder in my opinion from a legal, legal opinion. Uh, you know, they they understand because they happened there. I mean, we had significant Lancet articles that had to be retracted. But in the meantime, the damage that was done, the millions of people whose lives were changed and significantly altered, if not ended, because of these completely false, fabricated uh articles that were published in the Lancet, like that was the premier medical journal at that time, um, it happened. So for people to understand this happened then in that context, and that's why our work has translated into this like new arena of LGBTQT, trans or transgender, whatever. I don't even know what to call this, but to me, it's just like a fantasy land um, of, you know, I don't know. I don't know what to call it. I mean, so then what happens now that we understand this, now that we understand that we can't uh, trust the academic uh, establishments, we can't trust the medical establishments. I mean, what do you see? What do we do from here? Like, what is, thank you for unva un unveiling all of this, but now what do we do? Well, I mean, what normal people are going to have to do is defer to common sense as much as possible. What right. institutions are going to have to do is make the case for common sense and get try to get, for example, courtrooms to decide on what's visibly true as opposed to what's written in some you know, report that is of questionable quality. What academics are going to need to do is the ones that still have integrity is to start doing. In, I mean, we're going to have to have the biggest academic cleanup job in history, more or less. There's going to Right now, to get a PhD, for example, you have to do some novel research. To get a master's degree, you have to do usually something kind of like that, but sometimes it's just solve a really hard problem that's established or, you know, something like that. There's going to have to be a dedicated incentive structure built out within academia specifically for disproving garbage. If right. you go and you disprove 200 papers or whatever, then, you know, you can get some kind of a significant degree or appointment. That's, there's right. got to be an incentive structure for that. Right. What you're talking about is endemic. So you talk about the Lancet with, you know, COVID-19 and, you know, literally misleading reports or fab fabricated data, poorly constructed studies to show what they wanted it to show to mislead the public. Right. Um, I know that there's a lot that can be done by, for example, with drugs or supplements or whatever, by adjusting the timing. If you mm -hmm. start using the the treatment course three days too late, it won't have an effect. So you cook up some reason why you have to wait three days, you know, right. this kind of thing. Right. And but what you also have happening at the Lancet and it's even worse at the New England Journal of Medicine is all this woke social theory has now penetrated in and they're publishing it like almost every other article. So right. alongside serious medical papers, which we have to question whether or not they are activist driven or agenda driven and therefore are based on fraudulent data and results that have not been replicated. Um, we have to deal with ideological poisoning as well. Right. The same thing is happening on the other side of the coin. Like, you know, we talk about, you know, the murders, the deaths, the costs, the destruction. Well, we know, mm -hmm. for example, with the BLM riots and the fallout from that in the summer of 2020 bleeding over into the beginning of 21. We know that there was roughly 80 billion $80 million, I'm sorry, of charitable donations to BLM 
billions of dollars. I don't know how many billions of dollars of damages across cities. 20 some, 30 some odd, at least people died. Goodness knows what the trickle down effects from that are, uh, including, you know, policing backing off how many people have died from violent crime in, in Chicago because of this. These are real problems that have come up as a result of BLM. But the right. narrative that the police are systemically racist was based off of a series of papers, pri other than just the, the, you know, critical race theory narrative. It was primarily based off of a series of allegedly empirical papers that were published by a guy named, I think his name was Eric Stewart at the like Florida State or at the University of Florida, one or the other. And it turns out he just made it all up. He's been, right. he, he actually got fired despite his tenure and right. despite being, you know, a, a black scientist or whatever in these DEI conditions, he still got fired um, because his, his he just made stuff up so egregiously. But still, we have to deal with this damage. So we have this these two problems. There's another problem that's called the replicability crisis in the social sciences, social psychology primarily, where um, they are not able to reproduce the results that are coming right. out. You get a lot of, in other words, the incentives are wrong again. You get a lot of credit for some big splashy result. You don't get any credit really for testing a hypothesis and finding out that nothing very interesting is going on. And then nobody really gets any credit for revealing that some other study that was done was crap. And right. so we have this problem. So this actually goes into what do we do when I said we have to have an, this is not for you or for me, I guess citizen academics doing their own research can contribute in large ways. So maybe, yeah, if you have some research skills and want to do some digging and you can put it together. But the fact of the matter is that what we're going to have to start accepting as a gold standard in science is, in fact, not peer reviewed studies alone, but peer reviewed replicated studies. Right. If the study hasn't been replicated, then the study can't make it into the research literature because the replication crisis is is obscene and these other problems the incentives are still all wrong to get published and those become your incentives to get tenure hiring promotion you know chairs conference invitations everything in the world and your whole academic career revolves around getting papers published successfully and it turns out that it's as ever 10 times easier to write BS than it is to figure out that somebody's written BS or a hundred times easier to do BS than to do real work. Well, I actually think that you, in my opinion, you hit, you answered the question very at the very, very beginning of your answer, which is people need to do their own research and follow their intu intuition. I personally was actually going back to the COVID analogy, because again, I, I, this audience really understands what happened or, you know, we have dug really deep into that. That's where my, a lot of my work has focused. And then people ask how I'm transitioning and I hate using that word now, but how am I moving so fluidly? I hate that one as well. How am I pivoting in so easily into this new arena? And the answer is so clear. It's because it is the same playbook each time. So going back to COVID, I was personally very fearful of COVID. I have two, at that time I had two small children with, um, both have medical conditions, different ones, but had medical conditions that made me very extremely concerned about this respiratory virus. And I actually think that we had COVID in December, 2019, um, that put my eldest daughter in the hospital several times. And so when we didn't have influenza A or B or all the things that they tested for, and obviously at that time we didn't have time to test for CV-19. So we had no idea what it was. I went you know, scurrying home and locked us down because I was afraid of this virus. Um, but what I will say is while I was locked down and I'm feverishly researching, trying to figure out what's going on and what to do to protect us, that's when I started encountering these studies and I saw really discounterintuitive or whatever, unintuitive um, recommendations coming out from these health officials, like stay inside, don't breathe fresh air, don't get in the sunshine, make sure your vitamin D levels dip as low as possible, make sure you're extremely stressed out and disconnected from any personal relationships and, and interactions that might actually straight, not only strengthen your immunity, but your psychological and emotional well-being. And everything sounded off. And I'm not an expert, a, a medical expert or scientific scientist, whatever that means anymore. But I just knew in my gut that this wasn't right. So even though I was extremely fearful, I start, it started to open my eyes and my my brain and my heart to start asking questions and really take pull my head out of the sand and, and take a look at what was actually going around and having real conversations with people, albeit remotely, to uncover the truth. And I think that that 
um, equation that actually parlays perfectly into what's happening with children and in schools and with this. I, I don't even know what you call it. Queer theory. What can yeah, you mean? Like queer theory. What, queer theory is the right name. OK, so queer theory. So it, it's all the same. And, and just really quickly, I call it. So, you know, the Trojan horse. Now that I've done this work for several years now, I see what they do. For example, like you said, black, black with Black Lives Matter, that was systemic racism. Then we had COVID-19, we had for your health and safety, we had a novel virus and, and we had that. And now we have, again, queer theory and the LGBTQ trans movement. Each of these are a Trojan horse. It's the same Trojan horse, it's just cloaked in a different theme. Right now it's a, a rainbow banner, well, pink and rainbow banner theme. Um, but it's the same Trojan horse to usher in policies and procedures and laws, like you were mentioning earlier in Canada, that are stripping us of fundamental constitutionally protected rights um, and trying to redefine words, terms, and ideas and what society looks like as a whole. It's, it's pretty terrifying. And I know, again, that's what your work has been focusing on. I mean, what do you, wh where do you see this coming from and, and, and where do we go from here? Again, same kind of question. Well, yeah, you're, you're definitely perceiving what's going on correctly, uh, that this is the same playbook over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. That playbook, if you ask me where it came from, I would tell you that the answer is that the people who developed this playbook were very familiar with how Mao Zedong took over China in the Cultural Revolution and in the previous 10 years before the Cultural Revolution, actually 15 years before the Cultural Revolution, while they controlled China. And so... That wouldn't be going back far enough, actually, because Mao basically just kind of tweaked and appropriated it very successfully. He was probably the most successful implementer of of uh, a philosophy or a policy of conquest in in history. But he tweaked and 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 appropriated concepts from Stalin, particularly, but Lenin right. before him, and right. applied them to the Chinese peasant situation uh, right. very successfully. So uh, this is a communist playbook. Um, if we wanted to be, if everybody wants to get scared of that word, we can just use that it is a sophisticated insurgency or a militant ideologies playbook. And you're seeing the exact same dynamics play out in multiple domains. You see it in politics, whether or not you're a deplorable Trumper, right. never Trump, whatever. Right. You've got these different divisions. Then you have it with COVID, you're a masker or an anti-masker, you're a vaxxer or an anti-vax, you know, you got all these names that yeah. are causing disease and death and whatever else, it's your right. fault. And then you have right. in po identity politics, you have that you're a racist, a sexist, a misogynist, a transphobe, a homophobe, right. Jesus Christ, can you stop with this crap, right. phobe? And I mean, even Judith Butler, who is like the fairy godmother of queer theory, with having to list all these intersectional categories, finally started calling it that exasperated, et cetera. She got right. so tired of having to list all of the stupid identity categories every time so nobody felt left out. Right. That wouldn't be inclusive. So you see the same playbook where you have a division of the good people versus the bad people, or as Mao called them, the people and the enemies of the people. Right. And you create a dynamic that a friend of mine calls hate craft across the line. Yeah. You teach yeah. people that are doing the right thing according to the government or the regime, whatever they say the right thing is, those people are the people. And they teach those people to hate the people who are not doing that. So if you're not getting on board with the COVID-19 policy or the environmental policy, or the anti-Trump policy, yeah. or the identity politics policy, you're some kind of a bad name, deplorable hater, Trumper, you know, maggot, which is right. a misspelling of maggot. Right. Uh, I think they pronounce it maggot, actually, yeah. M-A-G-A-T, but yeah. it's, it's obviously a pun to maggot, like the, you know, larval fly, which right. is dehumanizing insect language. And I don't have to go through the whole exasperated thing again, this, but this is what they do, is they teach to do that across the line by a very specific mechanism that's going to make it's going to everything's going to make sense when you hear this because all these different domains politics environment uh public health and identity politics all are using this same dynamic which is that the people with the power the regime the agenda setters whatever are saying we can have a better place. We can have more unity. We can have a sustainable and inclusive future. We can pull out of this pandemic and get back to a build back better or whatever. But there are people who don't go along with us. Right. There are people who are holding us back. The anti-maskers, the anti-vaxxers, the racists, the transphobes, Trump supporters, 
you know, the deplorables, those people are keeping us from moving to our glorious future. So your job, if you're doing your part, is to hate them for holding us back because it's not our fault we have to keep right. the country closed. It's the unvaccinated's fault we have to keep the country closed. It's not our fault there's all these racial justice protests. It's that there's so many racists that have to be reckoned right. with. And right. so they cause all this pain and suffering and calamity and even death and get the people that are doing what the government says they're supposed to do to blame the other people who are not and to hate them. This formula came from Mao. It's his formula that he called unity, criticism, unity. Start by generating a desire for unity. We just want a place where everybody feels like they belong and then criticize those elements that are not going along with the new pressure for unity. And then we can arrive at a new unity on a new basis, which he called socialist discipline, and we call it sustainability and inclusion. It's literally the Maoist playbook playing out in yeah. every single one of these domains. So right. you are perceiving correctly that it's not, oh my God, there's a COVID thing for public health, and then there's the politics, and then there's the identity politics, and then there's the environment, and, and oh my gosh, it's you're now, no, it's not that. That's not that at all. There's it one isn't. domain. There's one thing happening just with a lot of different faces, a lot of different masks. Two things that, that you made me, that, that made me think of. Two, one, number one, who is they? And then the second thing is, is you kept saying unity. And even when, as you say unity, it like gives me a warm feeling inside. Like I like unity for as aggressive as, and confrontational as I can be um, in my professional life. And some might say my personal life, you know, unity is a good, is a good sounding word. Um, and so it's, it's very interesting that that dichotomy, because they're using that word and, and using it in a, in a harmful, deleterious way. Um, number one, and then how, how do you think, I mean, do you think that that's what saved us? Because obviously in, in the United States of America, it's all about individualism. It's about individual rights and individual property and individual. So do you think that that the, that rub between unity and individual individualism, which they characterize as selfishness um, and and lack of caring. Do you think that that's like the, the rub that saved us from like falling victim the last four years to this, you know, demonic plan? Yeah, pretty much overwhelmingly. Um, the American individual spirit, uh, and then the fact that our constitution is meant to secure individual liberties and that people in America still feel that in their bones, at least if they're over 30 um, or 35 maybe, has really played the, the crucial role. Because, you know, you hear, if you get a warm feeling when they, when you hear the word unity, but it turns out this is how the communists trick people. This is how the, this is how they tricked people a hundred years ago. This isn't new. They don't just you know, use words, they misuse words, but in fact, they pervert the words. So when they say we're going to have unity, what they actually mean is we have created a contrived standard and we're going to have unity under that standard. And they don't mean we're actually all going to come together. They're, what they mean is we're all going to do what we said. This isn't right. a voluntary unity. This isn't an organic or a natural unity. They're declaring the standard. In order for us to have national unity, everybody has to get vaccinated. And there was no no space at all whatsoever in that. It wasn't no. we have to get to 90% even. It was every time we got close to some percentage they said that we had to get to, the percentage went up. Right. It was everybody has to get vaccinated 100%. And the reason for that, as far as I can tell, wasn't anything to do obviously with public health and we can do whatever conspiracies we want with what they wanted to achieve with that. But I think the primary reason for that was that if it wasn't everybody, you couldn't force or demand true unity on a whole new arbitrary standard. And that's what this is about. So we're going to move into an anti-racist future. So everybody has to be an anti-racist activist, according to Ibram Kendi. And this is some people reject that, but those people get branded as racist. It's all set up to do the exact same model. So they're not using the word unity in the terms of unity. <laughs> they're using the term unity in everybody that agrees with us wants to have unity. And if you don't get on board, you're the reason that we're, we don't have it. And, um, and frankly, not we repelled this. If you right. recall, when Joe Biden took the presidency, uh, the first campaign the Democratic Party ran and his administration ran kind of as a rhetorical campaign or a public campaign was we're going to have unity now. Now that I'm president, enough fighting. You know, Trump is over. We don't have to fight anymore. Trump was the bad guy causing all the fighting. Now we can come back. The adults are in charge and we can have 
unity and actually about a hundred million Americans laughed at him. You know, we saw it. I remember him, him saying it in the responses immediately being on Twitter. Unity, according to who you like, we have to follow right. your rules. Like, no. And so it, this campaign, actually, the Democrats tried it explicitly, like with the word, and it fell on its face. But it's been more subtle, like you said, as a Trojan horse, whether it's wearing the suit, you know, the white coat of public health, whether it's wearing the rainbows of queer theory, whether it's wearing, I don't even know what the Black Lives Matter, black block or something like that, coming to burn down your police station of BLM. Like BLM had no positive public face. I don't even understand how it became so popular. Uh but whatever the, the outer garb is, it's the same idea. There's a Trojan horse and what's inside are, it, for, it depends on how clear and strident you want to be, but what's inside period are insurgents, ideological and, and practical insurgents who will come into your institution and transform it according to the demands if you let them in. But what's also, what was more clear to specifically to say is what's inside are Maoist active activists or, or Maoist organizers who are going to try to turn your institutions around their set of uh, utterly intolerant policies. So who is they and what are they trying to do? I know you're saying this is a communist takeover. This sure, is sure. Well, okay. The they question super hard, and this has nothing to do with Jews. So every time we get to the they, somebody in the comments is like, it's the Jews. It's not the Jews. Oh, it's just yeah. Not. No. It's always not the Jews, guys. Calm down. And what they then say is James is paid by the Jews. Attention, Jews, send your checks sooner because they haven't showed up yet. I haven't got one Jew check yet. This is terrible. But okay. It's not the Jews. The they like. Let's look at Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger was was Warren Buffett's business partner at Berkshire Hathaway until he died recently. I'm not saying that Charlie Munger is a they. I'm saying that Charlie Munger has a very famous quote, which is "Show me the incentive, and I'll show you the outcome." So, the they's in this case, we have kind of a set of different they's that are working in concert are the people who are incentivized to, to do or are incentivizing these things to happen. So we have these demonstrations that are being paid for by NGOs. You can bet whoever's writing the check to the nonprofit that's organizing uh, 5,000 people to block the road to an airport probably is one of the they's, right? And whether that's, you know, as you, they always have like these smaller ones and a subsidiary model. But if you follow up the chain, it's always somebody like the Rockefellers, the Tides, um, the Open Society Foundation, that's your Soros. Or you start finding tons of United Nations involvement. You find that the corporate environment is overwhelmingly incentivized by the World Economic Forum and what it's doing. You find that the educational environment is overwhelmingly incentivized by UNESCO, which is a subsidiary of the United Nations. And um, so we can kind of start to get this guess that the United Nations in collaboration, and, and then within COVID, of course, it's the World Health Organization, but that's subsidiary actually to the United Nations. So you get this idea that it's the United Nations working through these other arms like UNESCO, the World Health Organization, in conjunction with the World Economic Forum, in some kind of relationship with the CCP, undeniably, um, that are pushing, and the CCP, by the way, is the largest communist organization in the world, you get the idea that, that what we have is that these huge institutional players, most of which are on non-governmental organizations or nonprofits of some form or another, are creating incentive structures to get other people to do that. The other kind of they is the academics who are activists. These people are literally religious fanatic Maoists in many cases. I know they are. I've spoken in front of them and I've talked about Mao and I said, cheer if you support Mao. And they cheered in the room in front of other people. They know what they're supporting. And this is students and faculty. They know what they're doing. The faculty members in, that came out of the radical 60s and went into the, the 70s and then even into the 80s that kind of laid the groundwork. And these are your kind of professors that are going emeritus now. Um, these are the big storied career professors. They were openly Maoist in the 70s. They were openly supporting the Cultural Revolution. Read their writings from the late 60s and early 70s. You know, the, the revolution in China is showing us that a real a, a real popular basis uh, Marxist revolution can take place. This is where they were. So the universities have been increasingly filling themselves and pushing everybody else out uh, with people who think along Maoist lines, whether the ones today know that they're Maoist in every case or not is irrelevant. Many do. I've seen it firsthand. I know they do. But many may not. 
sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. When you you just said the institutions are the universities are filling themselves. Do you think that, for example, I think it's the University of Texas that has a um, campus in Dubai. Do you and and obviously Dubai is or Qatar might be one of those, and they're funding this university, and I think they're funding nuclear <laughs> research and technology. Um, do you think that the universities are filling themselves intentionally, or that this is a clan, like a secret um, plan that they've been sowing the seeds for decades, for example, like they did with the Catholic Church, and they've been intentionally and strategically placing individuals, um, subversive individuals, to move up the ranks, and then, and then once they got to the top, you know, make, you know, educate down, flesh it down, or I mean, what, do you think that this is intentional? Like, how do you? Think I think that, that, that both of those things were happening. I okay. think that both of those things have been happening. I think there is some intentional placement. These relationships with Qatar, the Asia Society, the Confucian Society, or Confucius Society, I should say. So many universities. You see tons of this foreign infiltration. Um, there's probably somebody who is not totally naive to what's going on right. at least in some of the places. And then it spreads organically <laughs> within faculty members. Um, there are there communists look out for each other. They try to get more people that are like-minded hired. Um, there's a educator, Henry Giroux, who famously brags that he spent, he wanted to bring critical theory into education uh, significantly. And it was boxed out in the early 80s, late 1970s of universities. You only had a few radicals here and there in education departments on campuses. In fact, education departments were by and large some of the most conservative schools on campus with possibly the exception of Teachers College at Columbia um, or NYU or whatever. The New York, NYU, CUNY and, uh, and, and, and Columbia tri triangle there has just been communist for a long time. But other than that, education schools were by and large somewhat conservative. And um, he intentionally went around and saw to it in, you know, a five to seven year span that he got, uh, he worked very hard to help about a hundred Marxists get tenured in colleges of education around colleges in North America. Now, if each one of those was not nearly as productive as him, but were to get five or six more that they recruited, that they helped advocate for at the tenure meeting that they threw a huge, you know, fit. If you say, no, we don't think that she's a good fit. Well, that's because you're sexist, blah, blah, blah. And they pulled the whole tricks. Academia had basically no, still has virtually no defenses to any of that. And so you have some of that that's very deliberate, but at the same time, this was the current campuses went radical in the sixties and they haven't come back. Um, the radicals have begat radicals. And um, it, so I think there were organic and, and what I described with Jarreau isn't inorganic. It's not like, you know, the common turn was like placing a KGB agent in, in the university. But there could have been some of that as well, um, for well, sure. You mentioned, you mentioned CCP. I think for, for me personally, it's we've, you know, villainized the China the, and it's a bad thing. But then at the same time, we're allowing Chinese to infiltrate uh, these policies, infiltrate our system. So are, are, are they, are American, they, are they in cahoots with China? Like who, it's still, again, I'm a little bit confused about. So that's, who is that's a super dark story that we're, I didn't okay, really we don't want to go there. Okay, well, we, we have, we can go there. It's people are going to be upset if we don't mention it. Yeah. So the system in ec the economic system that they have in China right now was not engineered by China. Mm -hmm. It was engineered by Americans from Harvard. Um, so you had these famous meetings. There's actually a movie about one of the meetings, a documentary that came out called Mr. Deng Goes to Washington, D-E-N-G, Mr. Deng Goes to Washington. And so that's referring to the Chinese chairman, Deng Xiaoping, or I think they called him president that came after Mao. So Mao, Mao Zedong dies in 1976. In 1978, Deng Xiaoping took over the presidency of China. There was a turmoil in between um, figuring out who was gonna lead, but Deng Xiaoping succeeds Mao. And China was a wreck. It was a complete disaster. Well, it turns out that a contingent from Harvard, primarily um, Kissinger and Brzezinski, were going over to China with even with Mao in, in place, trying to get something going on, a relationship there. Famously, Richard Nixon went over, tried to meet with Mao. And if you look at who was with him, it was the same fellows. Um, and so when... when um, Mao died and Deng Xiaoping took over. Deng Xiaoping inherited an economic catastrophe, mm -hmm. starving, dying people, an economy 
absolutely obliterated by Mao's psychopathy and communism. And he kind of threw up his hands and famously said, I don't care if the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. In other words, I don't care what kind of system. I don't care if it's pure Marxist socialism. I don't care if it has some, some businesses running. We got to get the economy of China running again. And Kissinger and Brzezinski, among others, um, met and figured out a new economic model for China where all of the, the China would become a huge corporate state. It would become, in fact, the manufacturer for the world, allowing countries like the United States to become a purely consumer economy, not a productive consumptive economy, but just a consumptive economy, a service economy, ultimately. So we would take away primary manufacturing from most of the rest of the world, locate it in China. China would be able to be uh, make a lot of money doing that, get their economy off the ground by being primary manufacturers, basically taking dis dispossessed poor people and communists, turning them into, you know, slaves working for, you know, a dollar a day or a dollar a week or dollar an hour, depending or whatever. And we all know about the suicide nets where they were getting mistreated so badly that they, were, they had to put up nets to keep people from killing themselves at work routinely. Um, and so China became the manufacturing base for the world. And in exchange, though, because China was a socialist country and Deng Xiaoping said it would all be done for the glory of socialism, um, they had very strict rules. If you want to participate in this Chinese CCP corporate subsidiarity model, that's this, what I would say is if we look at kind of, you know, before Lenin, you had communism 1.0 that didn't work anywhere. And then you have Lenin up through Mao and you have communism 2.0 that was actually brutally successful, but not at penetrating the West. Well, the CCP represents communism 3.0. And a lot of people are still thinking in communism 2.0 and they can't figure out how what's happening is communist. Well, China is running a model where all those big corporations, all those manufacturers, you can get rich as, I mean, and there's literally a show called Crazy Rich Asians. You can get right. crazy rich, but the only way that you're going to be allowed to make it at that scale in China is through your service to the CCP at the end of the day. And so you are, there's in a sense, one mega corporation in China that's called the CCP and every other corporation underneath it is subsidiary to it. So now you take a corporation that say, um, we'll take two examples. One is Nestle and one is Nike. Okay, so Nestle is a corporation, but it's a Western corporation, but they have a major office in China. It turns like a huge amount of money, blah, blah, blah. So they literally have a full blown China branch of Nestle that can't exist unless it's also CCP subsidiary. And then they can start working inside the, of Nestle to change Nestle's overall corporate policy um, so that that can stay, that subsidiary can stay fully active. Now we look at Nike, they probably have the same thing, but let's pretend that they don't. Let's pretend they're a purely American company out there in Portland and um, they wanna do business in China. The retail market in China, now that it's got a consumer economy uh, going, or production economy going, I should say, the retail market is gigantic. There's a billion and a, and a quarter plus people there, many of whom are idolize the NBA. Well, there's your NBA being woke, by the way. But they want to buy Nike, which they call Neek, is really popular there. And so Neek, Neek, Neek. And, you know, Adidas, Adidas. Yeah, I've, I've been to China. I've seen this. The brand name thing is huge. Well, Nike's not allowed in to their market whatsoever unless Nike finds policies that the CCP agrees with. So now Nike becomes not necessarily exactly a subsidiary, but kind of like a vassal company to the CCP. So now the CCP's values start flowing everywhere globally out of companies like Nike and Nestle, but also any company that wants to do a deal with the CCP and get past its socialist firewall. And as it turns out, they're our manufacturing base. So it's not like we can just tell them like we would have done to the Soviet Union 100 years ago or whatever to go jump in a lake. We can't produce many things like, you know, your favorite cowboy yeehaw, let's take back the border, you know, shoot the CCP out of the sky. Our, you know, yeah. probably doesn't realize that the United States has exactly zero primary lead manufacturers or uh, smelters. We cannot produce lead from ore in the United States at all. We have secondary lead, lead smelters, but we have zero primary lead smelters, which means if you want to go shoot at the CCP, guess where you have to buy your bullets? Right. The lead to make your bullets has to come from another country. And of course, China doesn't have any problem producing a large percentage of the world's lead. Uh, so that's kind of a problem for you. Meanwhile, those same exact 
economic and social policies. So this is really the they a little bit more deeply that people like Kissinger architected and Brzezinski ar architected in China with Deng Xiaoping. They created this model in the West that was epicentered at the United Nations and the World Economic Forum that is now called, after this program was developed, it got lumped into what is now called ESG. ESG was invented in 2003. So the tool, the idea was there. Stakeholder capitalism was the name of it all the way back to the 1970s. But the tool didn't exist until 2003. And it didn't really get off the ground until about 2009 or 11 after the big financial crash and then Occupy Wall Street. And then they realized that woke destroys everything. So what used to be called corporate responsibility or social responsibility blew up got rolled into the economic policies, got rolled into these very corrupt governance policies. And the whole point of ESG from day one, it created at the United Nations, by the way, the whole point of ESG from day one was to figure out how to use the reservoirs of passive investment money, primarily people's pensions in order to do impact, or in other words, activist investing. So what they did was they built out the exact same subsidiarity model to some ideological thing. It's not centered in the CCP now. It's centered in this weird conglomeration of the largest investment firms in the world, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, Goldman. We can go down the list. There's a fidelity. You know, I don't know what they are. BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street are always given as the top three. I think them combined owns, or I'm sorry, has under management something like either 40 or 60% of the entire S&P 500. So they have trillions and trillions of dollars of assets. In, in other words, people care what, what they think right. and do. And they actually have controlling ownership in terms of, you know, being able to use their stock that they don't technically own the money. They just own the, they, they hold the, the uh, shareholder rights to the stock. Um, so they can show up to say a Boeing meeting and tell them if you want to maintain access to your listing, if you want to maintain access to these indices for the index funds, if you want to maintain access to short term capital um, in order to meet your supply demand uh, spikes, all that's easy. You just have to be ESG compliant. And the S in ESG is social. And the S in ESG therefore means DEI. So you're going to be DEI compliant. You're going to follow our environmental policies. And you're going to govern your company by putting our people in your company or else we're not going to give you a good score. Everything goes to crap. So it's a gigantic cartel that's twisted all of our corporations. The goal is to make the corporations in China grow and the corporations in the United States die. That's the whole the whole point. But it's the same model in both places that was architected not by Deng Xiaoping and the Communist Party of China, but by Henry Kissinger primarily. And his men he had a, he had a, he had a <laughs> protege at Harvard named Klaus Schwab, by mm -hmm. the way who came up with stakeholder capitalism in the years that he worked with Kissinger at Harvard, getting a master's degree there. And so these guys came up with the system and found two ways to implement it. One was the test model in China underneath the um, desperation of an already uh, command economy with Deng Xiaoping, who's willing to take a shot at it, made China uh, very wealthy, dragged billions of people out of poverty, but unfortunately, the trade-off to doing that was opening up the West to not just a relationship with a communist country that se seeks to subvert it, but specifically that makes them dependent on a communist country that wants to subvert it. Meanwhile, these brilliant guys figured out, believing that this was the best system there was anyway, working with the United Nations and then with the World Economic Forum, that's Klaus Schwab's gig, so there wasn't much distance between Kissinger and that that they could implement this exact same system and be the oligarchs on this side of the world. Um, and then there's other reasons why they want to shrink the West and grow Asia uh, that are kind of another another matter of, of dark speculation. But the ultimate truth is that communism evolved to a third mode, a third presentation in the world, which is corporate subsidiarity is the method that it uses. And uh, China was the test model. Stakeholder capitalism and ESG um, and the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, so-called Agenda 2030, are the same program here. But ours is de dedicated to what they call degrowth, while theirs is dedicated to growth. And, and so what's their obsession with children? Why is there this, this, again, obsessive focus on children feeding this kind of information to children, attacking children and profiling them in schools, taking them from their parents? Where? How does that fit into this? Um, so children... 
uh, are very malleable. You can get them, you can install a, a worldview or a value system into them very effectively. They will believe fantastical things that are not true um, in ways that adults will not. And once they start to grow up, particularly with their parents' values, they become as equally likely as their parents to reject these things. You have an advantage taking it, taking over corporations, which is that corporations ultimately tend to be run by people who um, want money really bad. And so they'll make a lot of compromises if they have to. Like Nike might, whoever was CEO at the time might have known it was wrong to move into the Chinese market in some sense. But he also knew that the amount of money it would make Nike and him was astronomical. So he made a rational calculation and jumped on it and um, probably got very rich. So it's easy to incentivize corporate bigwigs, like CEOs. It's not as easy to, because their they're, the, their incentive world is, is whatever it is. It's not easy to incentivize the so-called rugged individual, the average American. It, you can, but not very well, um, not reliably. Children, on the other hand, you can warp. And if you warp the kids, there are two effects that will happen. One of two things will happen with their families. Either the family will renormalize around the children or the family will eventually split and the children will go separate from the parents uh, if you can turn them into militant ideologues. Militant ideologues don't bend on their views. They throw people out of their lives. Another way to put it, frankly, is that they're in a cult. So if you can drag the children into a cult, then what happens next is that they will either they'll either uh, turn their parents into people that support the cult through the parental the manipulation of parental love or they will break that relationship entirely um, which starts to tear apart the fabric of society and in both of those cases the communists actually win it turns out the third thing that can happen is that the parents pull them back from the ledge and that actually was significant to some of the struggles of the first 10 to 15 years in China and under Mao is that that parents were um, an anchor point where people would actually leave China to get away from the CCP. And it was primarily because their parents thought it was wrong and they would think of that. But here's the other thing. Children grow up and then they become adults and their their value systems don't become fixed, but they get very they can be very close to it. Um, they can become very difficult to change as they reach into their early 20s. And it turns out that if you spend 20 years educating or miseducating or really brainwashing and indoctrinating an entire generation of kids, now you have a complete generation that's going to work primarily for your interests. So they have to get, they don't have to get all parents out of the way. Inclusive parents are fine. They have to get parents who don't support the agenda out of the way. They have to get conservative parents out of the way. They have to get normal people out of the way so that they can um, take the children into believing that their purpose in life is to grow up to be a good global citizen. Their parents just don't understand. That means sustainability and inclusion. So we have to achieve the sustainable development goals and we got to be, you know, inclusive of all of our LGBTQ friends or whatever it happens to be. Um, but children are malleable. That's why. And children are their parents' world. And so they can have a tremendous effect. If you, I, I can't tell you how often this is the case, find a public official who wavered on the trans issue or whatever, and then came out as we would see it on the wrong side of it, look into their family, that they have a child, a niece, a nephew, something that's trans. So if you get a trans kid, which doesn't really exist, but if you can transition a kid and make them a, a hardened queer ideologue who's fully committed to this in a family, the entire adult um, picture changes around that. They all have to, like, let's say that I'm, you know, governor of Tennessee, and I have a trans, you know, net niece or whatever, right? So I have this going on. Every time I step out to give a speech to my constituents, I have to think that my poor niece is going to hear it and I'm going to get it when I get home. My wife is going to be furious if I upset poor little Sally that's going by Billy or whatever. And I have that holding me back from doing what I need to do as governor. And you will find that this is a, a compromising factor and an astonishing number of public officials because they've pushed this agenda into children so hard and so fast that almost everybody knows somebody who has a child or a, a, usually a child or niece or nephew who's gone through it now. Well, why, why trans? I mean, is this like the new eating disorder? Is Why mm -hmm. is it this issue? Yeah, I mean, it's actually, it turns out to be something that's fairly easy to lure 
kind of three demographics of children into. One are the ones who are just generally kind of misfits. And all of a sudden they have a way that they can become cool more or less overnight. They can go from being the dork that everybody makes fun of to cool pretty much right away. So that's one group. A second group are what they would refer to as the incel boys, the teenage boys who just can't get a girlfriend. Maybe they're going to, maybe they're, they're late bloomers. Maybe they're ugly ducklings. Maybe they're just weirdos, whatever it is that they're struggling. So they're not able to get a date. I didn't have a girlfriend until I was 18. So like I was this kid sort of, but those kids, they actually can feed them enough propaganda that leads them to do what the kids call trans maxing, which means basically turning yourself into your own girlfriend. They can't get a girlfriend, so they become their own girlfriend. And that's one of the primary vectors of um, male to female transition. Uh, not the only one, but there are others. Uh, but that's a very significant one in in kind of these dispossessed adolescents. It, it, all this, is, by the way, attaches very strongly to autism spectrum yes. scores as well, or other underlying personality disorder issues or trauma. But the third is girls who are have basically anything else in the universe going on who happen to be going through puberty, which turns out all the girls do at some point. And so when they go through puberty, many girls develop issues related to their bodies. It's a very, it, it, you know, stressful, difficult time. You don't know what's happening. People are looking at you differently. In fact, in ways that are very uncomfortable, you, you start to become aware that you are a sexual being that doesn't necessarily want to be one and that it's icky and inappropriate. Things are happening to your body that are like gross that you wish weren't happening. You might end up getting groped or grabbed or whatever, especially by jerks at school. And, you know, so all of a sudden you have like your physical body is going through a change that's not particularly great and it's causing you lots of problems. And you can tap right into that really easily by telling these girls. And I think this is why it's most significant right now. And the, the numbers have switched from boys to girls being the primaries that, um, you can actually very easily tell these girls, well, if you hate what's happening to your body, that's because you really are a boy inside. And you can lead them down a path that all of this then includes you're cool, you're affirmed, you're blah, blah, blah. Everything's good for you. Um, a lot of times not in the main classrooms, but in after school clubs where you get to escape the torment of the school day. So you have the natural condition of the alternating um, stress and then reprieve, stress and reprieve that actually is trauma bonding. Uh, 101, so they get pulled further into the cult. But also, so those reasons are good reasons for using it and targeting it. But the other reasons are the commitment is so high. It's so damaging. Right. Um, everybody involved has to start rationalizing why they're doing it. The parents have to rationalize why why they're approving what they're approving. They Values have to change significantly. And it is um, just in, so inordinately de destructive. But the motivations are underlying the, the same as why bulimia became a social contagion after Princess Diana came out and said that she had it. There was like a handful of cases of bulimia in the world. And Princess Diana said she had it. And then literally like every girl under 15 had it for like the next two months at least. And so uh, that already happened. But so, yeah, playing upon that that vulnerability, especially in the cohort of teenage girls of body discomfort, kind of pushing it into a belief of a body dysmorphia. And then rather than trying to treat, you know, if you were bulimic or you were anorexic or whatever, when I was in high school, there was a couple of people I was friends with that were, they were really good at hiding it. We were all shocked when we found out, um, you know, they knew how to dress to hide how, how thin they were. They knew how to hide their, their, their binging and purging or whatever it happened to be. But this is the opposite. This is actually just openly celebrated, it's like the biggest deal because between media and um, what they're actually showing with the inclusion programs at school, they've actually taught everybody that you have to affirm it. And so these people who have craved affirmation their entire childhood have an, a pathway to affirmation that's just unbelievable. And then what it costs them, it's, how do you come back? How do you come back from cutting off your own genitals? You know, I mean, it's like, some people will have the have the what it takes, but most people or many people, at least, will rationalize it and project it onto other people for the rest of their lives. They'll go nuts. And um, there are other dynamics as well. But I think that it's to create a group of people who have fully bodily committed 
to a very radical ideology and have very little way back. Um, parents are another problem. That's the inclusive parent. They have a, I mean, we talked about trans housing by proxy that, you know, these parents are trying to get virtue signals by proving how inclusive they are. Well, that's because everybody my age, which I'm in my 40s, was propagandized relentlessly in the late 80s going through the 90s of the horrible, awful, terrible conservative dad who would disown his gay kid. And so everybody's like in this disgustingly sick competition to prove, though that's not who I am. I wouldn't disown my kid. Look, I cut his dick off um, and I still love him. And it's like, holy crap, lady. But so there's this there's a dynamic happening with the parents, too. Um, and with physicians and with attorneys and with all of the other people that are in the broad apparatus of, of making that happen. But it, taking a step back, the Human Rights Campaign has it took a which was a civil rights organization for for gays back in the 90s, took a, a violent left turn into all of the trans issues starting in about 2008. Well, if you do what you should do and you say, why did they change their direction so vigorously? When they did, and you look, you find out they were also given a $25 million three-year grant by the Open Society Foundation at the time. Mm -hmm. So somebody was incentivizing the turn into this next mm -hmm. vanguard of radical politics, uh, taking it from a civil rights issue into a critical theory, um, which is queer theory in this case, which people wouldn't have necessarily recognized. Nobody was talking about these things except academics and, and activists, you know, 15 years ago. And is this, do you think this, this queering of the American child, that this is the most, if not one of the most important issues facing our country right now, or, or which issue? It is the think? biggest child abuse scandal possibly in human history. The only one that really makes me, it's certainly in Western history. Um, the Incas like sacrificing children like by the day to appease the, the gods or the volcano or whatever really um was kind of probably worse. But uh, besides that, certainly within the West, right it is the biggest child abuse scandal ever. And what you are producing is a broken and confused generation who is being taught the most insidious part of this isn't how much they're being broken or how they're being radicalized or how they're having stolen from them their capacity to go through identity formation in a healthy way with healthy boundaries. Um, their developmental potential. It's not even the the physical damage to the ones or psychological damage to the ones who get involved in it that's the most insidious part of this. Um, what's actually the most insidious part of this is what we learned with what is a woman. So what is a woman? And Kintaji Brown Jackson, who happens to be a woman, sits there and says, I would have to ask a biologist. Mm -hmm. And what the fact, what she communicated with that fact was, I don't know, I have to ask an expert. I can't yeah. determine the most basic facts about reality without turning to an expert. So we're teaching children. Are you a boy or a girl? Well, that's really up to you. And in fact, you're in charge of that. You're the expert. And then later, well, Billy says that he's trans too. And I don't think he is. Well, let's go through, you know, and all of a sudden they have to summon a, not a biologist, but like a gender theory person mm -hmm. or a psychologist who comes in and can manipulate in their psychology to find out if it's a real trans or a fake trans or whatever else. But they're teaching them. It's not just trans though. It's everything is two plus mm -hmm. two equal to four. Well, yeah, it is, but not all the time. It can equal other things. Look at this confusing math that you're not ready for mm -hmm. at fourth grade or whatever. And the answer is actually, they're lying, by the way, two plus two can only ever equal four. There mm -hmm. is no option. This, this, there's no ambiguity in this. Changing, for example, the numerical base doesn't change the value. So there are lots of tricks they play, but they confuse them. So how do you know what two plus two equals? Oh, we're going to have to ask somebody who's an expert. We have to go find somebody who knows. We can't solve problems about life ourselves. So this comes back to the communist thing, because what it actually teaches at the very end of the day is total intellectual dependency. They do not want, we've said individuals, what they don't want are independent, rugged individuals, which the Russians called kulaks, which Stalin basically liquidated across Russia to make sure there would be none of those. And um, Mao called rich farmers and landlords and liquidated across China. They do not want people who can independently ascertain what's going on in reality around them and make decisions about it that lead to a successful life. They need a state of permanent, constant dependency. And so look at what trans gives you. Right. Dependent on a medical situation, dependent on hormones, dependent on 
um, somebody to tell you what the next turn in the inclusion road happens to be. It's a complete catastrophe of dependency. And it's very overwhelming. It's exactly what you said. Two plus two equals five in this. And we're, we're inching closer to 1984. You mentioned parents before, and it kind of dovetails with, I believe we've discussed or tweeted about before churches and the conservative movement. You know, I hear you, you having some concerns about the conservative movement. What, what, what does conserve you, concern you about it? So classic communist strategy, which was also employed by the Nazis with Kristallnacht, for example, is when you can't get your way directly, what you do is you bait your enemy into doing something stupid so that you can get the massive public opinion to turn against them and um, disqualify them. This has actually got a name in, in political warfare that's called political nullification. So if you can get, for example, I don't know, a bunch of MAGA people to show up at the Capitol on January 6th and then claim there was a giant insurrection and now they're all insurrectionists. Maybe the country buys it and maybe it doesn't. Maybe it polarizes around it, which is what happened for us. It didn't buy the whole narrative, but it did polar. At first it did. I went with conservatives. I'm like, well, I'm going to admit that what happened at the Capitol was completely inappropriate. And it's like, uh, slow down. Hombre, but you, you polarize. But at the end of the day, what you end up doing is every one of those people is being persecuted by the Justice Department and doesn't really have any way around it. I heard recently that they announced, I don't know if this is correct for sure, so don't quote me too far on it, that they're even investigating people that didn't go into the Capitol now who were on the grounds um, yeah. outside and th that they're not done was the particular statement. We are not done with this investigation until we look into it. These are, they did nothing in the FBI's after them. So Imagine that you could bait a large number of people or even a small number of people into taking some kind of a cowboys versus communists last stand. It's going to be very easy with a public that is not all on board with what's really going on. I talked to a number of people who still are in kind of the Democrat bubble, um, whether they're academics, whether they're family members, whatever it is, and they are not all on. They, 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 they're tipping out in most cases. They're starting to see cracks, like some stuff's not making sense. The sex books in schools is kind of upsetting to almost every one of them that I know because mm -hmm. um, they're still decent people besides their weird, you know, CNN religion. Um, but they are not like, even when they tip out, the most common thing I hear from disaffected Democrats is that they want to find a Democrat they can vote for, not a Republican. Mm -hmm. They're not ready to take the full leap <laughs> to the other side, so to speak, which they think is cringe and embarrassing and stupid and evil and all these other things. So they're not with you. So if you can get a small group of these people to go cowboys versus communists, the, the regime, CNN, the institutions, everybody, all at once, this is a vertically integrated messaging apparatus, as I refer to it, will basically shoot like a, a PSYOPs laser beam onto the, onto the population, get them to say Christians are a huge problem, give them the political capital in the Biden administration to start cracking down on churches to the very fullest extent they can stretch 1A. And the Christians have actually taken themselves out of the game rather than done something productive if that were to happen. So all you need is one church that goes full Westboro Baptist or, you know, starts doing something ridiculous or attacks um, some, you know, drag show shows up and a church goes out to protest it. The next thing you know, Antifa picks a fight. Now there's a scuffle. The only thing that comes out is some dude with a cross and an American flag and a beard punching a kid or something. And it turns out he's 16 or something like that. It was an Antifa prov uh, provocateur wearing like a trans flag. And now the entire public sentiment switches on the issue to, we have domestic terrorists coming out of our churches and that's a problem we all have to solve. And you know, they're going to push it like crazy. So I hear, not, I hear you. Like I hear you. I, I mean, we're getting a lot of chats and a lot of questions. And I, I actually remember when Trump got indicted, everybody wanted to go. And I did a little reel about that. I said, do not go. This is J6 2.0 at that time. I know you've tweeted similar sentiments for the convoy that's heading the border. And the question is then what do we do, right? So they've technically won if they've silenced us and we can't exercise our first amendment rights to peace, peacefully gather at a location to protest to protest what our government is doing to us, then they've effectively won. So what what can we do? What can Americans do to save their country? If, if Yeah, it's very frustrating. And um, 
I, the feeling is that we can't do anything. Are we, in a sense, sacrificing some reach of our ability to assemble? We are mm -hmm. uh, strategically because we're not dealing with Americans. We're dealing with communists and mm -hmm. they will set you up and take advantage of it, as we learned poignantly at the beginning of 21 on January 6th. And the spell will break where we will be able to gather peacefully and assemble and the mass of public opinion will go with us at their vertical, vertically integrated machine messaging machine won't work, but that's not yet. And so what we have to do is we have to take every available means that we actually have. That's not us walking into a trap. You are not silenced. I heard, I saw nothing during the border, but a bajillion tweets a day, people talking about it. I saw a bajillion shows. I saw a bajillion videos. You're not silenced. Just don't show up physically where they're going to try to provoke something that they can get on camera, take out of context, put on CNN and ruin everybody's life. You can say whatever you want on it. Try not to advocate for violence. It's not a good idea. You have to take what other options you have. In this case, what did I do during this? Well, I worked with every rep or every official that I have con a connection with in Texas to try to get the legal apparatuses uh, within the state of Texas moving. The file in the circuit court, for example, um, an appeal to the injunction asking immediately for constitutional advice to review on the precedents, not, not an advisory decision. You have to sue for um, a review of the precedents of what to do when the federal government has, has claimed Article 4 powers but isn't exercising them, is refusing to exercise them. What now? It turns out there are no precedents for that because the federal government's never gone rogue. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you open the door for a either circuit court or a Supreme Court to be able to talk about the issue on its merits. Biden played very, very good lawfare with that injunction, which was also just an injunction. The Supreme Court usually doesn't overturn precedents in an injunction hearing. Exactly. But they asked, they didn't ask the court to tell what to do or whatever to rule out. They said, will you review your precedents on whether the federal government or state government has authority here? And they did. And the Supreme Court, we're all acting like it betrayed us, actually came back with a very surprising result, which was, yeah, Texas can go put up the wire all they want and mm -hmm. the federal government can go cut it all they want. So mm -hmm. what do you do? If you want to be a citizen journalist, don't get provoked into violence. You know, you're rather than a convoy, which could be infiltrated and all kinds of things. Or if you work for the state of Texas, you hire somebody inside your apparatus to go film the federal government cutting the wire, using a forklift to lift the wire, let people pour through, and you make them look bad day after day after day until the, oh my God, 7th of February. That's all you had to wait because that's when the case is actually being heard in the court. Mm -hmm. The injunction exactly. only lasted two weeks. You're flipping out over an injunction for two weeks, not yep. the loss of our country at the border. So you have to keep your head and you have to take advantage legally um, using other channels to communicate to take an organized strategic action. Yeah, write a bajillion letters to the Texas officials. That's what I was doing or actually texting them and calling them. Do everything within your power to... Push this through by the book. If you think the book is lost, you're not helping. Um, I understand your frustration. The best thing you can do is donate money to people who haven't lost their head. Uh, that's basically what there is left. And support ballot initiatives like our Protect Kids um, CA ballot initiative and support work like yours and share this information. I think it's really important to educate ourselves and to do, you know, participate in winning strategies, like you said, that don't, that don't put yourself put yourself in, in danger, especially when we have a government that has weaponized the Justice Department. And is yeah, Merrick Garland's the most dangerous person in this country right now. And people need to recognize it. Like, this is not normal times. So I put this picture on Twitter the other day, and everybody watching the show would not have seen it. But it shows two graphs. And it shows, a, you know, it says your expectations. And it shows a line going up at an angle. And it says progress, right? And mm -hmm. then it shows underneath it, it says reality. And yeah. it shows you staying at zero for a long time and then the line starts going up and it has a, a, a little bracket above the flat part. And it says frustrating, but still progress. We have already got past that part. That's what we've been dealing with for the past, you know, five years at least is that we're now awake or waking up to the problem. Yeah. It seems like nothing we do achieves anything. So we're frustrated, we're mad, but now we're actually winning court cases. The court is siding with us. We are actually dismantling their apparatus. DEI will probably die this year. Um, the Supreme Court put a fatal blow in it with college admissions with 
uh, a huge decision last year that was done through the courts. It took a long time. That's true. But DEI is not probably going to survive much longer. ESG is on the rocks. They lost the natural the bid for making natural asset companies. Courts are increasingly siding with people that it is a 1A violation in a number of different ways, even profoundly like worldview level ways, not even speech ways, to force people to do the pronoun thing at schools. We're making progress. We're winning school boards. We're winning county uh, county boards. We're winning over actually the Republican Party in different states where the Republican Party hasn't been helpful. We're making progress now. There's so much effort and so much energy that can be poured into productive things that are not some, you know, cowboys versus communists last stand at the border or anywhere else they set us up at the Capitol, at the border, at the whatever, which turns out like I sat that back watching this convoy and I know they want their voice to be heard. Like what, what do they hope to accomplish when the left does a huge protest? They have a pol piece of policy waiting on the other side already yeah. written that already has the votes to win. They just are looking for the justification to push it to the floor. What are you what are you going to do? 700,000 people are just going to show up in the middle of nowhere in Texas because they said they weren't going to go too close to the border so they didn't get J6. What what are you, what's the why? What Not are you sure. accomplishing with it? And so that's just unstrategic action when we have so many productive things to do. You mentioned Protect Kids CA. Imagine getting the issue of all of these child transitions and girls, uh, trans people playing on girls sports directly on the ballot in California. Minimum, what we end up with is a national conversation and the Democrats dumping tens of millions of dollars into trying to stop it while looking ridiculous for trying to stop it. Public opinion has shifted overwhelmingly on this issue in the last two years. They overplayed their hand with this big time. And so it's like, that's a very productive use of time. So what do we do? Find something productive. I understand that it's largely happening through courts um, or even through state legislatures, but more through courts, honestly, and back those things up, get involved. Um, you want to, 700,000 people want to go to the border to hell with that. Go to California and help Aaron Friday get signatures. Absolutely. Get done in two weeks. Exactly. We could get it on the ballot right away. And like you said, we have I mean, extreme majority of, of across all party lines supporting this ballot initiative. And we do need all the help that we get. It's, if we took those 700,000 people and got their signatures, we'd have the 550 that we need by mid-April to get it on the ballot. And then it would become law that actually would stave off these harms that you're talking about. 700,000 right 700, people. So it's going to cost them a lot of money and gas to drive wherever they were going to drive. So let's say it's a hundred dollars in gas and laugh in our hand. So mm -hmm. 700,000 people give a right. hundred dollars each to the, to that initiative. That's $70 million. Can we, do you think we can reroute them to our website? Protectkidsca.com. We could just make some, uh, save a well, couple months for your book. We got to get the, the audible of your book. There's uh, a serious uh, answer to this is what is driving the concerns that I have on the right is that, we are justifiably frustrated. We, in fact, very frustrated. So the primary thing we're looking for, people say, what do we do? We want action. They don't want action. They want catharsis. They, they want something that lets that negative energy out. Right. They want to see a breakthrough, not realizing that the way that we're going to win, the way that a corrupt regime or a cartel or anything, look at any case in history. How do they, they fall? Slowly, then all at once. They slowly get discredited. They slowly start taking losses. They slowly start getting public opinion against them. Then all of a sudden, the whole thing falls to shambles. This happened in the Soviet Union. This happened, uh, you know, in countless regimes in the you know, Middle East and South America. It ha it's happened in every cartel that ever got busted using RICO or before RICO. This is how you take down organized crime slowly, then all at once. So we're slowly, in fact, we're almost to the tipping point. So it's, this is why it's so frustrating for me for people to I feel agree. to be that frustrated that they're going to throw it away because we're at the point where a lot of people realize something's badly wrong and they're getting a pretty good sense of what it is because we've put a lot of information out. We're doing really great educational campaigns across the, the, the world, frankly. And we're approaching a tipping point where the thing could fall apart very fast. I don't think DEI survives intact this year, for example, and that, that's humongous. I have, well, from your lips to God's ears, I hope you're right. It's a distraction and it is frustrating when we have these very real concrete actions that we need to be working on at 
this exact moment in time. So I, I hear what you're saying and I agree with you. I, mean, I do it all the time and I work with grassroots people all the time and the grassroots people are doing real work and it's really easy for me to sit on the internet and run my mouth. Well, I really appreciate you supporting the Protect Kids CA ballot initiative. We worked really hard on it and we will see it on the ballot. Earlier, just a couple minutes ago, I'm laughing because you mentioned Garland and I have a game that I like to play. It's going to take just a couple seconds, two minutes Hopefully you're you're up for it. Are you up for just a little quick game right now? Have you yeah. heard? It's Patriot, Traitor, Pass. Okay. Have you heard that like drinking game where it's like, I'm going to date her, I'm going to marry her, or I'm going to pass. Have you heard that? You played that before? I don't think that that's how the drinking game works. But It doesn't, but I'm, it, I'm, I'm playing Not to it. the a FMK game? game audience. It's, but we, we call it Patriot, Traitor, Pass. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a couple names and you let me know if you think they're a patriot, a traitor, or you want to pass. But from you, I'm expecting a little bit more than a pass. Just going to let you throw it out there. Okay, we, we talked about, talk about Garland. What about Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House? Um, do you need a third option, which is neither, because we could do a 20-minute discussion on Mike Johnson. So um, then basically you're saying you're going to come back on my show later once you've thought about it and we'll just do a more in-depth on something. I would say yeah. that he he veers more toward Patriot, honestly, but it's complicated. Cool. That has to be not just pass. It's complicated. Okay. We'll do for we'll do the James Lindsay edition. will be it's complicated. Patriot, traitor, it's complicated. Taylor Swift. No, traitor. Okay. Thank you. Robert Kennedy. Uh... It's weirdo and it is that an option? James, this is not your show. Okay. I already let you go with it. It's complicated. Yeah, I know, but complicated. I'm just saying. I don't know. <laughs> Pass. How about Donald Trump? No, Patriot. Okay. George Bush, George W. Bush. No, oh, traitor. Ben Shapiro. <laughs> Patriot. With How with a laugh. Okay, that's I okay. Another column for because yeah. here's I won't say this immediately next to Ben Shapiro's name. Never mind. Okay. There's a reason these people are complicated. What about Vivek? Patriot. Jordan Peterson. Canadian. <laughs> no, Jordan's legit. He's he's a patriot. I think he's an academic, which is another category we can't use because it's not my show. Okay. Well, Academics are in general, and I'm sorry, Jordan, if you hear this somewhat naive to the political forces around them in general. Well, hopefully this gets to him. We'll see what he has to say about it. What about Russell Brand? He's kind of in the academic arena now. I think he's actually probably a patriot, but British. it's complicated because, yeah, well, not just British. He's like also like new age. Right. But he, I don't know if you know, he's getting very religious. He's exploring Catholicism, taking up his spirituality and is very seriously. Are you still a, a card carrying uh, atheist over there? What's going on? I don't know if I have a card. Do you want me to get Charlie you? Kirk makes me call myself agnostic now. Okay. So what about Charlie Kirk? Patriot. Tucker Carlson. Oof. Oh, I was not expecting that. Um, AOC for the right. <gasps> Ooh. Oh, that was not a column that I was expecting. Okay, you're coming back. We're going to talk about this. Jeff Bezos? Uh, I mean, these big the big CEOs, It's they veer toward trader. Okay, so then Elon Musk? Autistic. James. I can't I'm telling you, these people, are, these are not... Traitor, I'm I'm too autistic to call somebody a traitor who just thinks that like this crazy cool technology that you could build that could be used for the worst possible purposes ever, right. but it'll be fine, man. Don't worry about it. Like, I don't think that Elon actually has bad intentions if that's what this is really about. In other words, Patriot, if I have to pick that way. I see what you're saying. But his, his first brain chip patient is doing really well, I heard. Okay, so, I mean, we've talked about communism, queer theory, the border, conservatives, Christian nationalism. What all of this being said, all of your work, we have a couple of minutes left before you have to go. What do you want your James Lindsay legacy to be? I want to, so communism and uh, things like it have been a persistent problem in 
the world at least well for just communism for at least 200 years mm -hmm. and it somehow it's like we kind of defeat it and then it comes back and we kind of defeat it and it comes back i don't want it to come back again i want to dig it out by the root and i want to get to the bottom of what it is how it developed and create eventually though probably other people do most of the creating educational materials that prevent it from finding its way as easily into uh, our societies in the future. But I want a full proper diagnosis that goes to what the root of it actually is, um, which I don't think has been done. I think we've been actually fighting the wrong thing and that's why it keeps coming back. So that's what I want to pull the whole thing up by the roots, which if that means I have to grab the serpent from Genesis by the tail and rip it out of the ground, that's what I'm working on. Okay, well, I am here for that as well. And we are with you every step of the way in whatever way we can support you. Everybody, huge thank you to James Lindsay. You are incredible. And again, really, truly an uh, inspiration to me. Uh, when is your queer queering of the American child? It's dropping on February 29th, right? Is it? That's right. The queerest day of the calendar. We did it on purpose. The calendar. So we will keep an eye out for the queering of the American child. We will read it and share it with as many people as possible. Any last words you'd like to leave with our audience before we let you go to your next interview, your next engagement? Yeah, I got to go talk to the Australians next. Um, last words, don't lose faith on this country. If you're listening to this, you're a patriot, you're probably frustrated. Don't lose faith on this country. Um, if you're a Christian, I usually tell people, why do you doubt God's timing when they start getting all frustrated? And I leave you with the words of a friend of mine, Jason Preston from Utah, where he says this a lot. He says that he thinks that this is a you know pivotal moment in history. And um, he asks the audience, he says, do you think God would send his second string to that kind of fight. And if you obviously would say no, because you're a Christian and you're faithful, then guess what? Your first string. So you got to get in the game and you have to play like varsity, not JV. Um, so if you've, you, it's on, you've got to do that. And all this kind of cowboys versus communist stuff is junior varsity. Um, keep faith in this country and that its mechanisms and that it's good people can be brought back to uh, putting it back in order. I, that's what's going to save it is people that still have faith in it. Wow. Thank you, James. That was perfect. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. And again, I really appreciate your time and your work and everything you've done for our country and, and our children. So thank you so much for being here. Yes, ma'am. All right. We'll talk to you soon.